I'd like to welcome everyone to the seventh community facilities meeting. My name is Ginger Brown. I'm the vice chair of the community facilities study, and I'm going to be leading you tonight because John Milliken is presenting at the committee of 100. Tonight, we are going to be discussing public facility siting and programming, and we have three case studies for you tonight. Our first is Fire Station 3, and Nancy Iacomini is going to be discussing that. Jennifer Smith from the planning staff is going to be discussing the Arlington Mill Community Center. And Carrie Johnson is going to be discussing the work of the TJ Working Group. After we conclude our case studies, we're going to be moving on to our table discussions with the resident forum. And as usual, everyone will break into 10 tables that are around the room. And we will lead a discussion on the facility siting challenges. Hopefully by now everybody knows that we have a website, we have a Facebook page, we have a Twitter page. Uh, if you're looking for Wi-Fi password, it's knowledge. And I also want to point out that we do have an email address. So if you ever have any thoughts or concerns or questions or ideas, please feel free to email us. This is our overall schedule, and I'm sure you've seen it before. Uh, we are now in May, and we've gotten to the citing case studies, and we're going to be uh, finishing up that. Uh, we're going to be looking at, in June, matching of facilities' needs with financial resources. And I'd like everyone to put June 2nd on their calendar because we're going to have an open house. And so there'll be lots of things to look at. Uh, and so it's just an open house. Uh, July, hopefully we'll be wrapping up our siting principles and process. So hopefully our subcommittee will be to a point where we can give you something to see. And then we'll have a report uh, to deliver to the county board, hopefully an initial draft by September of those siting principles so that it can inform the 2016 to 2026 uh, CIP. And as part of our charge, it's, we are charged with proposing criteria and a process for siting any new counting or school facility or adding or expanding uses to those facilities. And again, we are uh, doing this in order to inform the CIP process, the 2016 to 2026. We're going to do a very quick review of the things that we've learned so far. Uh, under revenues and economic factors, Arlington has a very unique revenue structure. We have 50% of our residential uh, taxes, or 50% of our taxes come from residential center and 50% come from our commercial base. That's highly unusual and it's highly desirable. Uh, we do face some challenges in our office market and our high vacancy rates. We looked at demographics and there are some trends. We have many more children ages zero to five. We have a great increase in folks over the age of 65. Um, millennials are, were our dominant generation, but they also are the ones that are most likely to come and go, to migrate in and out of Arlington. We looked at the forecasting and enrollment projections from the school and the county, and we learned that they are two, two sets of data one is used by the county in order to fulfill the Clean Air Act, and the others are used by the school to, um, to forecast children coming into the school. And they both have purposes that are needed and useful, and we need to keep those separate. But there are plenty of chances to collaborate between the two. So we brought, we looked at, also we figured out that our multi multifamily housing is about 64% of our housing housing stock, but the net new housing is 94% multifamily. Our single family neighborhoods are changing, but there's not really a net new increase in the number of single family homes. It's just the smaller homes are being torn down and larger homes are being built, and so there's more bedrooms, so there's more kids. Most of our overcrowding is coming from our single family homes, um, but student generation factors um, for all types of housing is increasing across the board. And this is just a little diagram of the two distinct uh, ways that the county and the schools do their projections and their forecasting. 
but in the middle, the development pipeline data is how they connect and how they collaborate. So we had a consultant come in and talk to us about what our if our methods are good, and they are, but they can be refined. We can collect more information, including uh, information, housing data on renovations, unit types, length of ownership, sales, and this refinement of the data can help us better predict student generation uh, factors for each type of housing unit, which will help us better predict um, the number of kids that we have coming into our schools from different housing types. And then we went to land and facility inventory and needs assessment. Arlington is growing in population, and we have demands across the board. Um, we have demands for public services, open space, schools, everything, pretty much. But we have limited land. Uh, Arlington only owns about 2.2 square miles of our 26.2 square miles of the county. It operates 105 facilities, 87 are, are county owned, 18 are leased. And then we're also well aware that um, in the current CIP, there are processes that are ongoing. Uh, the Salt Dome, Lover Run, Fire Station 8, EOM relocation, the Art House facility, and the Trade Center, um, those are not inside this, are not in the scope of our study, uh, but they are ongoing and they are relevant. So, we need lots of things. Um, and we definitely don't have adequate indoor and outdoor recreation and park facilities. Um, but we do have a strategic partnership between APS and the county to maximize what we do have. And uh, the, public the Public Spaces Master Plan just kicked off and that a lot of the information that is going to come out of that and the data will influence um, our end result. So that's where we've been in a very short amount of time. And now I'd like to introduce Nancy Iacomini, who is going to do our first case study. Oh, there she is. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I am chosen to use the podium. Usually I like to walk around, but if I do that, then instead of 20 minutes, it'll be 40 minutes, and that's not good. So if I have my notes, this, this should work out well. <clears throat> So I'd like to thank Ginger and Susan for inviting me to give a presentation to you all this evening. Uh, I have only been able to attend, I think, one of the facilities meetings, but I have been trying to follow everything, both on the website and talking to folks, and you guys are really doing yeoman's work. Uh, a little bit about myself. I am currently vice chairman of the County Planning Commission. I've also chaired the Transportation Commission and the Historical Affairs and Landmark Review Board. And I've lived in Cherrydale since 1998 and in Arlington since 1980. Uh, I was asked to present because I was the chairman in 2003 of the Fire Station Number 3 Relocation Task Force. And our efforts did end up uh, contributing to our new station that's on Old Dominion Drive. So the sighting of Fire Station Number 3 in Cherrydale is somewhat of a saga in the true sense of the word saga. It had lots of twists and turns. Uh, and I just want to go over a little bit of our early efforts uh, before the task force, sort of what started the task force, our process, and then what we learned. Cherrydale has long been home to a fire station. Uh, in the early 20th century, our volunteer company had a water wagon and a hand-drawn pump and hoses. Uh, in 1919, the volunteers in the neighborhood erected a station that still stands on Lee Highway just east of the Five Points intersection. As time went on, however, it became clear that volunteer fire companies would not be able to continue to meet the demands of a growing community. Arlington began to hire paid firefighters, and the paid firefighters and the volunteers shared the small station that was on Lee Highway, or that still is on Lee Highway. Of course, the population began, it, it continued to grow, particularly after World War II. Uh, more stations were needed, and by the late 1980s, it was clear we needed uh, more capacity in North Arlington, and so the Cherrydale station would have to be either augmented or expanded, which wasn't possible because they only own the land on which that building sits, or a new station found. After an early public process in 1990, the 
the site just to the east of the historic station, which we called the Nichols site, was chosen. And it's the older building with the white sign that you see right there with the American flag. Bond funding was approved for the Nichols site, and the county pursued acquisition of the site. In June 1994, the county board adopted the Cherrydale Lee Highway Revitalization Plan, and indeed, we called out the Nichols site as where the station would go. It was going to be a very important placemaking element for the neighborhood. And meanwhile, the, con the county did a second bond round for funds for the new station. Studies were conducted in 1999 and 2000 to evaluate the delivery of fire protection in the county and make recommendations for improvements. And at this time, Cherrydale residents and members of the volunteer fire company routinely asked the county when construction on the new station would begin. They did not get a firm answer. Uh, the answer really came to us in 2002 when Cherrydale was surprised to learn a local developer had filed a site plan for the Nichols site. Uh, so clearly the county had made a decision, but it really hadn't been communicated to the neighborhood. Uh, the neighborhood participated in the site plan process, albeit reluctantly, and what we call the Bromptons then, the Brompton site plan, consisted of a multi-unit residential building on Lee Highway, picture of it is here, uh, as well as townhouses and three single-family houses that transitioned to our single-family neighborhood. That was ultimately approved and built. But it was felt there were still no good answers being given to the neighborhood about why the county had abandoned the Nichols site for a fire station, and even more importantly, where would the new station go? So in fall of 2002, the uh, county started having discussions uh, with the citizens about the new station. So there were some neighborhood meetings held in 2002, 2003. No consensus could be reached at these large gatherings. As you can imagine, there was a lot of back and forth, still a lot of sort of pent up angst from a lot of the citizens about why did all of this happen? Why are we here today? So the task force I chaired was convened in early 2003 and it reported back with a choice of three ranked sites in August of 2003. The county ultimately acquired a portion of the site that ranked second, the Toyota dealership at five points. Frankly, the task force had envisioned a station where the main building of the dealership sits at the intersection. You know, so it would sort of have a nice vista coming up Lee Highway and we could all say, instead of saying, oh, we live behind the car dealerships, we'd say, Cherrydale's right there where the fire station is. However, there was a lot of issues, a lot of land ownership, uh, just a lot of things that really sort of made that not possible, but it did make it possible after much negotiating by the county to get the rear portion of the site. The county began the design process for the station. In 2007, though, structural issues cropped up with the Brompton's multifamily house, and we had a hole in the ground for a couple years. And at that point, the neighbors did raise the issue of how about let's put the fire station back where it was supposed to be, at least supposed to be in their minds. And we did have discussions with the county, but again, because, the Brom because they had begun with the Toyota site, uh, there were already townhouses that were built directly behind the space where the station would be. It was decided that that choice would not be good and the county would continue with the site on Old Dominion. And ultimately in 2011, the new station was delivered, and it is quite lovely. <laughs> it really is. Our new station, though, is, has won awards, but our historic fire station still serves our community. It is very much a center of our community life, and we're glad that the volunteers still have it. But to get to that new station, the county and the citizens had to first come together and identify sites in the wake of 2002 site plan process issues. So we, as I said, we were formed in February 2003, and our members were representatives not only from Cherrydale, but from the neighborhoods in what was called the first due response area for the station. The task force was given a relatively short time frame in which to deliberate and make decisions. It was decided early on that for transparency, uh, we would be making decisions by public balloting when we would go through sites. We focused our efforts on finding the best sites and not considering land ownership or acquisition issues. Uh, we did not feel that we should be negotiating with ourselves, but would rather keep factual criteria foremost in our deliberations. 
and our members actively represented their neighborhoods and informed their respective neighborhoods of what we were doing. There was also great community interest in our meetings, so we made time for public comment at our meetings, and the county put our information up on their website. Of course, it's nowhere near as robust as what the county has today, but uh, we, we did have it up there. So our first step was to establish criteria whereby sites could be evaluated. The criteria we used came from discussions uh, between county staff and residents and was informed by consultant studies. We really tried to keep life and safety issues at the fore, as well as adding quality of life parameters suggested by citizens. There are some of them you see up on the screen. After much debate, the task force coalesced around 17 main criteria that were applied to every site. And this is the full list of the criteria. The task force cast a wide net as well for a site for 17 possible sites. We tried, we had people brainstorming, we had input from what the 1990 advisory committee had done. We had some it, things that had come from the public forums that had been held, and we of course had ideas from our own group. This is, these are some of the sites. These are more of them. You can see we are thinking all kinds of places within the good response time area. The Nichols site, which was then under site plan, was also included. And this is because the community had long been told that that would be the site of the new station. It had much to recommend it because of its proximity to the historic station. And frankly, there was no way that my neighborhood could let go of that idea. There would have been no way for us to move forward as a task force if we had spent a lot of our time debating whether or not to keep the Nichols site on the list. So we said, let's keep it. That to sort of open the floodgates and let us talk about all the other sites since we had to come up with three or four sites. You'll notice on here, too, is the SPC Old Bowling Alley site. That would be the land on Quincy Street, which the county has recently uh, put out, put a con purchase contract on it. So it is uh, land which has long been thought of that could house a facility. Every task force member had their own favorite site, but we did have to come down to three to four to recommend. So instead of just having staff evaluate and report on each site, Members of the task force teamed with staff members and did their own presentations. Uh, they were the ones that talked about the sites that they thought were, were best. But before we did those, the task force developed a standard questionnaire and evaluation sheet that was applied uniformly to every site. This is the first page of what was a four-page evaluation sheet. And by the way, all of this material, I believe, uh, staff has posted to the facility's website. Uh, so you can see the full report. Presentations were made. Much discussion ensued. We began balloting to eliminate sites, and balloting continued throughout the summer. We had been charged, as I kept saying, with three to four sites, and so as the sites narrowed, the group began to ask for more information. Uh, we then got into the layers of traffic, response times, uh, questions about biz financial aspects of businesses op that were already on certain sites. In addition to our own deliberations, we hosted a public meeting about the sites before our final balloting, and it was very well attended. And in August, we had our three sites to recommend to the county board to fulfill our charge. The Nichols site, the Coons Toyota, and Brown Honda. So after all of that, what were in those months some lessons I think that all of us on the task force learned, uh, our neighbors learned, something that I've been thinking about for a while since I was asked uh, to do the presentation. And I think one of the many good takeaways uh, was that communication between the county and citizens really is paramount. It would not be an understatement to say that Cherrydale really did feel blindsided by the county when the site plan process for the Bromptons was announced. You know, I'm sure that there were very good reasons why the county had abandoned the Nichols site, and perhaps it even made that known to some citizens, but it really didn't get to the core of our civic association or even the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, the lack of 
communication, the silence from the 1994 bond to 2002 was very detrimental. And in fact, there are some people in our neighborhood that really don't have a great feeling about the county because of this still to this day. So if a site has been publicly announced, whether it's been acquired or not, if it's in documents and mentioned in bond issues, the and the county changes its mind, the citizens need to be informed. When a facility is being cited, particularly one that needs to deliver a service, like a fire station, all the areas to be served by the facility should participate in the siting process. Citizens and county staff should have ownership of the process together. This can be done by having a citizen chair the process and having citizens actively work with staff to present data and findings to the entire group. This really fosters a lot of trust and mutual understanding. And I, I can't emphasize how important that is as well. I also believe good design can solve a lot of issues, but when you're siting a facility, I don't think we should rely on design to make the site right when it isn't. It's not a shoehorn to make something work that really shouldn't work. Uh, also, a tightly defined scope of work and a firm deadline for a work product produces good focus, as it does in anything, but particularly in a working group. Uh, and the siting of anything, whether it's a new school or a new house next door, really can engender a lot of emotion, both, both positive and negative. So to the extent possible, it's good to focus on facts. It can be hard, but, but it's really helpful. And a corollary to that would be that no site should be taken off the table without a factual reason related to how it should function. Cost is a fact, but it's not a fact that limits how a facility could fulfill its civic function. It's a factor, among others, that could take sites out of consideration, but that should happen from discussion and not be presupposed to the point where citizens would be told not even to discuss something. You know, as I said before, we can be given to negotiating with ourselves sometimes, and I I admittedly find myself doing that sometimes with some site plan things that we do at Planning Commission, and that's actually not a good thing. We should let ourselves find the best places to do the functions that could work and then start the discussion of should and eliminating sites for clearly understandable reasons that might be related to other county goals. So thank you for your time this evening. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to think back over something that had happened a while ago and, and, and see it in a different light.